Welcome to this uh, PCR webinar uh, dedicated to a hot topic, which is the treatment of heavily calcified coronary stenosis with a novel technology, the intravascular lithotripsy. My name is uh, Emanuele Barbato, interventional cardiologist at the Cardiovascular Center Aust and professor of cardiology at the University Federico II in Italy. I have the pleasure and the honor to share this webinar with two esteemed experts and friends um, Michael Halder from the Rhineland Clinicum in Neuss, Germany, and Benjamin Anton from Clinique Pasteur in France. Welcome. So uh, in the next minutes, we will have the opportunity to discuss the impact of uh, Disrupt Cut 3, this recent trial that has been recently published in the uh, last weeks on our clinical practice. Let's see what are the learning objectives of our session. Stay with us if you want to learn how to optimally adopt intravascular lithotripsy for the treatment of calcified lesion. If you want to appraise the latest results from this RAPCAD 3 clinical trial, and last but not least, if you want to understand the mechanism of action of intravascular lithotripsy on the latest OCT evidence. Let's see the next slide. This is what's on, on our agenda. We selected two clinical case examples from our practice. We'll review the data from the study. Having said that, uh, I think we can, uh, we can start, Benjamin, with the foundation of this uh, webinar, basically discussing what are the principles of uh, operation of the intravascular lithotripsy. Benjamin, please. Thank you, uh, Emmanuel. So you know that the shockwave technology is made of uh, three components. You can launch a video. So there is a generator, there is a, a connector, and there is a catheter. And almost of the technology is enclosed in the catheter, which is an angioplasty balloon with uh, intravascular lithotripsy emitters. And these emitters, when they receive the electrical energy, are making an expanding and a collapsing vapor bubbles, which in turn create a short burst of sonic pressure. And this sonic pressure will interact with the arterial wall and uh, going interact with the calcium, uh, making some micro and mi micro fracture on uh, the uh, calcium lesion with a nearly effective pressure of 50 atmosphere. And one thing which is very different from arteriotomy is that it impacts the antimal calcium, but also the deeper calcium. Next. And so you can see on OCT, very classical pattern of uh, what you can see post IVL. You can see on the left side, a uh, very tight stenosis with a circumferential calcium arc with a lumen of nearly 1.8 millimeter square. And after IVL, you can see this microfracture at 12 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the antimal, but also in the media. And it is associated with an immediate gain of the lumen area. And this phenomenon is increased after the implantation of stents. You can see on the, on last, on the right part of the slide, you can see that the lumen area increased after uh, the implementation of stents, which prove that IVL uh, by the microfracture and the microfracture on the calcium increase the vessel compliance. Thank you very much, uh, Benjamin. We already have a, a question here. Can you uh, share something about the percentage of dissection after intravascular lithotripsy? And then we move on. Stay on the OCT slide, the one before. Do you have any idea, Benjamin, about the rate of dissection that we can achieve with intravascular lithotripsy? Yeah, this is something that's... Uh, is uh, known now from the study, and uh, it's a, a feature of IVL, it is very safe. And rate of major complication is less than 3% in all the CAD study. And we can have the discussion at the end of the symposium on the safety of this, of this uh, device. That's fine for the moment. We'll come back on this, as you said, during the next part of the webinar. Let me go to Michael now. Uh, do you want to add any specific technical uh, points here in terms of balloon length, balloon size, how many times we can deliver the shocks to our vessel, all this kind of information. 
Yeah, Emanuela, thank you very much. Actually, on that slide, we can nicely see we have three different catheters available. Two, the S4 and M5 are more for peripheral artery disease. So I will focus on the one, the C2, which is the one for, for coronary application. This one has two emitters and allows to um, give 80 pulses, eight runs, 10 pulses. Um, it has different diameters available, 2.5 to 4.0 to accommodate most of our lesion spectrum that we nowadays address. What is important to say that currently we only have one balloon length available, which is 12 millimeters in length. It is fully compatible to 0.014 guide wires and important to say fully compatible to six French sheath. So this is the device you can see at the bottom that we can use for a coronary application. Thank you, Milo. Michael. I know you selected a very nice case. I think this is the moment to share this case with our colleagues. Please, Michael. Yeah, Emanuele, um, if we can go to the next slide, which gives a brief history of that, that patient. Can you give us the next slide, please? So it's a 70-year-old male patient uh, who's on arterial hypertension and uncontrolled dyslipidemia, and he's a heavy smoker and being on hemodialysis for 15 years. And we know that these patients in particular being on hemodialysis have uh, heavily calcified coronary arteries. He presented with stable angina in CCS2 class, and in cardiac MRI, he presented a stress-induced inferior hyperkinesia. With that, he went to coronary angiography, and there, three vessel disease was uh, uh, documented, and he first received intervention of the circumflex artery and the LAD lesions with a total of three drug eluding stents. And the task of today in the next slide is to address these two. Um, RCA stenosis. And what is important to realize is before the contrast appears, you can see almost the full appreciation of this huge, large right coronary artery because there is a lot of, lot of calcium in there. You see the proximal lesion very eccentric, almost subtotal. And distal to that is another eccentric one you can best see in the um, RAO projection. So this is the task, what we need to address, Emanuele. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Just for your uh, information, I'm the one getting the question, Michael and Benjamin. And I can tell you, the colleagues are already warming up because I've got several questions here. Uh, I want to reassure our colleagues from home that by the end of this webinar, we'll address them all. Just allow me to fit your question in the right flow of the webinar. So I'm not neglecting any of you. All, all comments are very welcome. This is really a bunch of calcium, Michael. Really, really impressive. Uh, so before disclosing your uh, strategy, your treatment, let me tease a little bit our colleagues from home. And I prepared a multiple choice question here. If we can go back to the slide. Yes, this question uh, is for you uh, from home. How would you treat this lesion when you look the angiogram? And I offer you three options. Would you give it a try with balloon PCI? When you see this, would you immediately open the rotational arterectomy device or would you uh, try with intravascular lithotripsy? Now, while we are collecting the comments from our colleagues, Benjamin, I want to hear your opinion. And then we go back to Michael. How would you treat this lesion? Uh, it's a challenging lesion. It's uh, critical. It's heavily calcified. It's a huge right coronary artery. Um, I think that we need to prepare the lesion. It's mandatory, uh, atherectomy or either. But I see uh, three issues with the uh, atherectomy. First of all, it's a, a right coronary dominant artery, so there is a high risk of AV block. Second, it's uh, critical, and so you have a risk of burr entrapment. And then it's a large vessel, and so you will need a large burr. And so, and so far, a large guiding catheter, at least seven French. For in this view. Uh, I will try IVL first in this very challenging lesion. Okay, fair enough. Uh, let me ask the Regie, when collecting the opinion of the colleagues, try to sum them up and provide them with percentage, you know, 30, 40%, 50%.
at least I can convey a message to our colleagues. Michael, I'm looking forward to hear from you how you treated this case. Yeah, when we go to the next slide, we, we're going to see what we did. First of all, we selected a six French Amplatz one guiding catheter to have a very good support to this right coronary artery, which is very calcified. Second, we had to treat that uh, proximal lesion almost like a CTO. It was extremely difficult to pass with a wire. Finally, we used the microcatheter together with a hydrophilic coated wire to bring that down to the artery. By doing so, you can see that the flow to the distal part of the RCA was almost, almost uh, shut down. Now, the question is, what are we willing? First of all, I totally follow Abajama's explanation why not to use the rotablator here. In particular, with these challenging things where we even were not able to bring the microcatheter over that lesion, just close to it in order to better steer our wire, the, this uh, complex rotor wire is very difficult to bring down there. And if you don't bring it down there, you cannot rotablate. So our goal was, on top of that, that that was a focal lesion to go for IVL. The IVL catheter that I showed to you is somewhat more bulkier than the catheters what we usually use. So almost uh, not very likely that this is going to pass that heavily calcified subtotal lesion. So our intention then on the next slide was to predilate this lesion first. And we had to do that. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, we had to do that with a small balloon in order to even in enhance our pushability we put a guide liner down to the proximal lesion and then we were able to advance a 1.5 millimeter by 20 um, small balloon there. We opened that balloon, not uh, too much, 12 atmospheres, and that is what we then achieved. This is potentially not good enough to bring the, the IVL catheter there. So next slide, please. We improved our predilatation with a non-compliant balloon 2.5, which opened there. But again, this is not in this, this large artery able to change the full compliance of that calcified lesion adequately to go there with a the stent. So now we made the way capable to bring our IVL catheter down there. And that is on the next slide. Mark, Michael, if you allow me to interfere a little bit uh, up, till, uh, up to what you have shown so far. And I have um, two questions to you. The first one relates to the mother and child catheter. Uh, I understand perfectly the reasoning behind of having a very supportive uh, setup in this uh, particular lesion. Um, is there any matter of concern in choosing the size of the guide liner or guidezilla or whatever uh, as it comes to the size of the intravascular intertripsy balloon? That's the first question to you. No, actually, the, this, is, this is six French compatible. You can even bring uh, the catheters, the IVL catheters, through the guide liner in six French there. The larger versions, once they are deflated, are a little bit uh, pulley to, to bring back, but it's, it, it works. So if you, if you really address these kind of large arteries, usually you can go for seven French. That gives you a little bit more of freedom. But here we, we selected a six French one um, because that was the one that we were able to torque into the ostium of the right coronary artery. But again, it worked. The second question to you and the same one to Benjamin as well. Do we always need to predilate a calcified lesion before doing intravascular lithotripsy, or do you really base your decision um, depending on the angiographic appearance of the stenosis? Well, it's, it's case-based. If I have such a tight calcified lesion as it is in this case here, I won't give it a try. I will directly go for predilatation and opening up the lesion a little bit to facilitate bringing the, um, the IVL catheter down there. If I just have a so-called angiographically appearing normal kind of stenosis, which is calcified, I would give it a try um, to go directly there with the IVL catheter. Benjamin, any different opinion uh, on this point? No, I absolutely agree with Michael. It's case-based. Uh, on, you, on critical lesion, it's mandatory to predilate, as we have on the CAT study. Uh, you can use a 2 millimeters balloon, and it always 
most of the time the crossing of the Ivy Lucas Stadium. Thank you very much. Uh, please, Michael, let's uh, see further your case. So you can, you can see here three sequences where we brought in the 4.0 by 12 millimeter IVL catheter there. We give the full amount of pulses, eight times 10 pulses to the lesion. Um, we always do that uh, twice at the, same, at the same spot. So twice 10 pulses at the same spot. Then we change the position of the catheter a little bit in order to really get the best modification of the compliance of the of the underlying plaque, calcified plaque. So this is what you see here. The balloon is mostly completely open. And when we, next slide please, look at the angiographic result after the IVL. Again, something you would not expect in such a heavily calcified artery. Um, you see a, a quite nice uh, angiographic uh, angioplasty result. Please appreciate this is not a, a dilatation balloon. This is just an application balloon. So we go up to four atmospheres, maximally six atmospheres. This is not changing too much in, in, in such a heavily calcified lesion. So you need to really change the compliance of the underlying lesion um, in order to get such an angiographic result here. So then if we go to the next one, we repeated the same approach for the distal lesion. We first open it up with a 2.5 non-compliant balloon, which you see here. Then next one, we had to use a second IVL balloon, again a 4.0 by 12 millimeter balloon that we were now able to bring down there. You can see that our guideliner was able to pass the proximally already pre-dilated and pre-treated uh, lesion with the IVL to facilitate bringing the IVL, the second balloon, down to the second lesion. Again, we take the full range of pulses, eight times 10 pulses. Michael, then, yeah. can, I, can I interfere on this very uh, uh, slide here? Also because we just got a question from one of our colleagues. What is, if there is a threshold to which you would use the number of pulses available? Let's remind again to our colleagues that we have the chance with each intravascular uh, detrotripsy balloon, each shockwave balloon, we have the chance to deliver eight times 10 pulses. So eight cycles of 10 pulses with a total of 80, eight zero pulses in total. The question is, do you always use for that given stenosis all 80 pulses or do you have a threshold beyond which you stop? So in, in general, I attempt to take the full range of the eight times 10 pulses. Why is that so important? Um, if, if you are not able to change adequately the compliance of the lesion and you have withdrawn your IVL catheter, um, we know that any kind of uh, inflated, deflated balloon has a totally uh, worse crossing profile to bring it back again. So that makes the whole story totally more difficult to go back again. I always use the full range of pulses to address for a certain lesion, a part I would use the catheter or a part of these pulses for a second lesion, which is more upstream or downstream, in order to try to go away with one device. But here, in this particular heavily calcified lesion, from the beginning on, I was sure to use one catheter for the proximal and one for the distal, applying the full range of pulses to each of these lesions. Thank you. Let me hear also the uh, position of uh, Benjamin. I know we have it there, Benjamin. What Michael has just uh, said now is you have the therapy readily available. Why not to use it all instead of sparing it? But are there situations in, uh, in practice where you would perhaps envisage just to be happy with the result you achieved after you know, 40 pulses, pulses, 50 pulses? What is your experience there? That's a very good question. We, we don't have uh, answers. We don't have answers about the number of pulse, as uh, Michael said, but we don't have issue uh, to think that there is an issue to deliver all the pulse. And if we go back on the literature, you can see that on the CAT study is nearly six cycles which have been delivered by the operators. So I fully agree with Michael that there is no issue to deliver all the pulse. And if you have a stage lesion, giving 
samples for the proximal lesion because the possibility of the balloon to go back distally after is very low. So I think it depends on the experience of everybody, but uh, rather in my practice now, I deliver all the all the pulse of the catheter on the lesion. Let me also reconnect to one of the questions from our colleagues who suggested to use intravascular imaging in this kind of uh, lesion setting. I will give you the word on this point, whether you use it for all uh, these cases or whether you think uh, intravascular imaging is not really mandatory to treat these, uh, these situations. But perhaps the use of imaging would enable to see whether you achieved sufficient plaque modification and then perhaps to stop the number of uh, pulses you would deliver. That's one of the points that can be, of course, uh, uh, discussed. Honestly, in my own practice, I like to use imaging in this setting, but that's not mandatory. I can manage these cases also without imaging, but I, I want to hear your opinion, Michael, and perhaps uh, if you will move further with your case. Yeah, for sure, imaging, intracoronary imaging is not mandatory to do IVL. Um, I think it is helpful in the beginning to get an appreciation of the distribution of the calcium and the amount of calcium. I think in this particular case here, it's not necessary. Angiography tells you immediately that there is a huge burden of calcium. Um, in order to guide how much of the pulses I'm going to use and base, make that on the basis of the intercoronary imaging, I won't go for that. The reason for that is if imaging or whatever tells you, you, are, you haven't done so far, you need to give more pulses to the lesion. To bring the device back again is a challenging thing because the deflated balloon is much more bulkier than the initial device size. So. If I can go then back to my case in order to show you what we have achieved for the distal lesion, very similar to, next please, very similar to the proximal lesion, a very nice angiographic appearance of that pre-dilatated or pre-treated um, lesion with IVL. I think it's not so much dilated, but it's, you see, it's, it has cracked the lesion. It has changed the compliance of the lesion to make even a four and six atmospheres dilatation, um, creating such a nice angiographic result. So with that, uh, we then move forward. Next, next please to first uh, send a distal desk to the or a desk to the distal lesion and then a second one to the proximal lesion both 40 in diameter the distal one more shorter the the proximal one 18 millimeters you can nicely see that these balloons are open at 16 atmospheres so probably you really have changed the underlying compliance of that heavily calcified artery so, and then the final result, um, next please, really shows you what we have achieved in this huge dominant right coronary artery. Um, I really have to say that I like this result uh, for this amount of calcium that you have there. Um, that is really something which without this kind of technology, we probably would not be able to achieve that. I perfectly concur with you. This is a beautiful result, Michael. Let me take the opportunity to discuss some of the points raised by the colleagues. Uh, one important and interesting point is the following one. With intravascular lithotripsy, you sort of switched the usual order of treatment. We tend to treat sequential stenosis by addressing distal and then to the proximal one. With IVL, you address proximal lesion and then distal one. And when it came to stent, you stand the distal first and proximal after. Any thoughts on this? I think in this particular case, that was related to the tightness of the lesions. I wouldn't be able to address the distal lesion first with this tight subtotal stenosis proximally to that. So I first had to, 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 to treat the proximal one. But what was important that we didn't finish the treatment of the proximal one with a stent. So we just made the pre-dilatation aspect with the IVL and, and created a nice, nice result. And then we move to the distal one to prepare this. And then once when it comes up to the stenting, we really go with the first stent to the distal lesion and then did with the second stent, the more proximal lesion. 
Now, I want to disclose the preferences of our colleagues. So 50% of our colleagues agree with you, Michael, they would have done intravascular intertripsy. 50% would have done rotablator. Now, since you treated the patient in this way, I will go one second to measurement before starting your case. In case you would be in the shoes of this colleague and having treated this patient with rotational atherectomy, I mean, which size of the rotablation bar would you have taken in this case? Uh, it's a very challenging question. Um, I think I will take at least 1.75 or 2 millimeters burr. So big burr, at least maybe a 2 millimeters burr. Uh, the, the size of the artery is at least 4 millimeters. Michael uh, put a stand of 4 millimeters, but with a high inflation for nearly 4.2. So I will use a 2 millimeters burr. Okay. I think we have uh, we have uh, seen a, um, a nice case, and we have already touched upon several interesting uh, um, educational points. Uh, we have a, a lot of questions to address uh, that I would like to fit later on in the webinar. Um, I guess we are ready now, Benjamin, with your case. If you please show the slides. Uh, next, so I will share with you uh, uh, the case of a 50 years old woman is suffering from hypertension, dyslipidemia is a smoker, and he has a stable angina with a, a large, uh, large ischemic burden on the inferior and the inferior lateral wall. Next. And so you can see on the coronary angiogram that there is a critical but focal stenosis on the distal part of the RCA with a, on the right coronary artery, which is uh, very large and dominant, next. And one feature which is very important is that you can see that there is evil tortuosity on uh, the second part of the uh, right coronary artery. And this feature must be taken in mind when you have to choose the therapy delivered to this patient. Yeah. When we focus on the stenosis, you can see the size stenosis, but also there is massive and circumferential arterial wall calcification. It's indeed uh, impressive, uh, Benjamin, the amount of calcium that we can see already under the fluoroscopy. And what I noticed in your case that we add additional level of difficulty in this, in this case. We have here tortuosity and, and distal location of the lesions. That are two important factors to include in the equation when we tackle this kind of question. So let me tease our colleagues from home by posing them the same question I posed with the case of Michael. So if you have this case in your cat lab, how would you treat this lesion? Would you give it a try again with balloon PCI? Would you go right away with rotational arterectomy or would you go right away with intravascular lithotripsy? Please share your opinion by stating one, two or three on the, uh, on the uh, chat. While I'm asking the question to Michael right away, how would you treat this case of Michael? So, Emanuele Benjamin, this is a dominant right coronary artery, large vessel, very focal, more distal stenosis, obviously very calcified. The challenge here is the tortuosity of the proximal segment. So what I would, I, first of all, again, like to have is a good guiding catheter support. Again, I would consider to use a guideliner uh, to support that. Um, I would bring down a, a, a one of my preferred standard wires there, and then I would just give it a try with a non-compliant balloon. Um, one to one balloon to artery ratio, go to a rated burst pressure of the balloon and see whether the stenosis is opening up, yes or no. If it's opening up completely, probably it's fine. If not, you need to do something different. And there, because of the proximal tortuosity and the focal aspect of the lesion, my clear preference is to use an IVL catheter in order to change then the compliance of the lesion, make it predilatable and uh, complete it with a stent, a death implantation. Benjamin, show us what you did here. And so we follow uh, Michael's advice. If you can have the case, so we try first uh, to predilate with a non-compliant balloon. It's a 3.5 millimeters, 20 millimeters length, and raising up at 18 atmosphere. And you can see the footprint, the stenosis that are a bit left on this uh, predilatation. 
And so in this view, we change our mind and go uh, for an IVL next. And to increase our support, we will use a body wire technique. We try to avoid uh, the uh, guiding catheter extension technique because of the tortuosity. And so we go on the body wire. And you can see this nine, nice progression of the uh, C2 shockwave catheter, four millimeters balloon, uh, until the distal part. And of course, uh, you can see that the body wire technique has straightened the second part and the tortuosity of the right coronary artery. Next. And at the beginning of uh, the acoustic burst, you can see at the end of the first cycle that there is uh, no more footprints on the uh, balloon. And at the end of the thick cycle, you can see that there is almost 5% of residual stenosis on the lesion, which has not been left with a 3.5 millimeters at 18 atmosphere. Next. Raman, can I, can I interfere on this slide before moving further? Because then we have the opportunity also to address one of the points of the colleagues. So first of all, I'd like to ask you whether you had a lot of friction with these two wires, one next to each other, when nicely demonstrating this advancing of the uh, IVL balloon, of the shockwave balloon up to the distal uh, lesion. Any, any friction there? No, it was... Quite surprisingly, I don't have any friction despite the tortuosity and the calcification on the mid RAC. Uh, one thing which is important, one tips and tricks, you have to avoid twisting, of course, of the body wire uh, to uh, improve the deliverability of the catheter. But you know that the profile crocile is nearly 0.042 inch of the ideal catheter. But you can see in this case, this is particularly challenging anatomy, that with, with a simple technique of body wire, you have a, a quite easy uh, delivery of the catheter. That's indeed a nice demonstration. And the second question, which is interesting, and it came from one, one of our colleagues, is there any interference of your body wire with the pulses you are delivering to the stenosis? So that's a very technical question, and uh, I think we don't have the answer. There is no data to say that can be an issue on the body wire with this technique. And um, in my mind, it's something that is better for IVL than atherectomy, it's especially if you treat a bifurcation and you have to left a, a, a guide wire on the bifurcation that you cannot do, of course, with the atherectomy. And so I think it's a, a pretty good advantage on, of IVL. That's a good point. Please, uh, Benjamin, go further. So next slide. So you can see the intermediate Anjou uh, after IVL. And as Michael said in the first case, it's a quite stent-like uh, angiography post uh, uh, lithotripsy without any uh, dissection. Next. And something which is very interesting in this case, we have a lot of difficulty uh, to uh, deliver a four millimeter editing stent. And we need to use, uh, the, you can see on the left side, we need to use a guiding catheter extension uh, to deliver the four millimeter depth. And you can see the final angiogram without residual stenosis in, the, in this huge, large vessel. Yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, again, another very nice case. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Benjamin. We can take the opportunity to address some of the questions. Uh, there are colleagues, by the way, experienced uh, in the community who are sharing uh, their feedback with us. They say no issue at all with the uh, second wire. And that's actually the advantage of this uh, technique that you can always keep your uh, second wire in a side branch. Um, I noticed that none of the two neither in your case nor in the one of Michael, uh, further balloon dilatation was performed after intravascular lithotripsy. Any, any opinion on that, uh, Benjamin? I think, as Michael said, it's not a pretty latest balloon, but we have to keep the advantage of a low-pressure inflation balloon. And there is no residual stenosis, so I don't think you need to predilate uh, the vessel after the IVL, if you don't have any residual stenosis, like in the case we present with uh, Michael, to avoid dissection, to avoid uh, wall inflammation. So I will try to not predilate after IVL. Uh, and now a question to Michael. I'm not sure this is really pertaining to IVL, but more in general to the treatment of calcified lesion. 
would you always envisage to do post dilatation after stent implantation or not? Um, not in general. As you have seen in my case, we didn't post dilate it. We put the stent in there. We had a nice result. We left it like that because we did the work up front. We did a very good pre dilatation. We changed the compliance of the underlying lesion and we got a nice angiographic result. If that is not the case, and if we go to the trials, the trials requested to do a post dilatation after stent placement there to really open the stent and oppose it uh, optimally against the vessel wall. We will go to the study uh, in a short while. Uh, of course, should that have, should have we done this case with the uh, imaging guidance, some of these questions would have been addressed by intravascular imaging. I'm saying this not to reiterate again our preferences here. It's just because it's one of the points that is repeatedly coming back from the community. You know, using of IVUS uh, or using of OCT is always welcome as long as it is reimbursed, as long as it is readily available in your lab. But again, you can do also challenging cases without imaging if you have uh, the experience to do so and you, if you are comfortable with that. If not, use of imaging is also, also very welcome. Um, let me share with you what is the preference of our colleagues. In this case, interestingly enough, uh, Benjamin, no one opted for rotational aterectomy, while half of the colleagues would go with a balloon attempt first they would give it a try with a balloon, like you both said. Some said with a non-compliant balloon, some said with an opium balloon. And if that doesn't work, intravascular lithotripsy. That's interesting, actually. There is a sort of going away from the fear we have when we intend to use rotational aterectomy. If the intention is to go rota, we always fear to dissect the vessel with a balloon attempt. But in this case... It seems like people is uh, not afraid anymore of, of giving it a, a try. What do you think, Michael? No, I, I think we don't have to be too much afraid with the rota. The, the point here in Benjamin's case was really this significant tortuosity with the corresponding wire bias, the rota wire bias that you potentially achieve there. So this this is something which, which you try if possible to avoid. Therefore, and in particular, if it is a very focal lesion, uh, honestly speaking, this goes for IVL in my hands. If that wouldn't be so focal, if we would have a very diffusely calcified lesion there, I would not hesitate to use the, the rotor there. You can protect the whole thing there with a guide liner. So we have techniques in order to do that. But in this particular thing here with that focal lesion, I think the IVL is a very, very good way to go. And the result supports that view. There is a question, Benjamin, perhaps this is to your case. Since we, we really observed a stent-like result, just with intravascular lithotripsy, one of the colleagues wonders whether um, there is the possibility to deliver intravascular lithotripsy without further stent implantation, just to, to leave the result like it is. How would you feel about this point? Mm, I, th I think we are at the beginning of the adventure, and so... We don't have, we, 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 this is not a message that we can share to the community. I think we stay on the predilatation, we're given the therapy, we, we modify the plaques. And so uh, I would go definitely in every case for a stent. Michael, do you have a, an opinion on this? No, I absolutely agree with Benjamin. So the, 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 the way, as you see, we, we get a nice angiographic result, we know that. But Benjamin has shown us these OCT cross-sectional images where you see how the artery looks after the lithotripsy, after a dilatation. We know there are little dissections. So that is something that is existing, especially when we talk about heavily calcified lesions, the one that I had, the one that Benjamin had. So going without a stent as the final treatment, I think, is not a good idea. Good. I think we have seen a nice case demonstration of this novel technology, but where are the data to support the efficacy and safety of this device? I think we are uh, lucky enough to have the recent publication of the Disrupt CAD 3, CAD 3, 3 trial. Sorry. Uh, so why don't we have a look at this data? Uh, Michael, would you mind to start? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what you have seen with the two cases In here the is that cases. it's kind of technology re really is working very, very well. 
So um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, the efficacy, that is the thing here. And if we look a little bit at what was treated within the Disrupt Cat 3, um, next, please. You, you can see that the, the average length of the calcify uh, segment was uh, 47, almost 48 millimeter. So this is excessively long. The lesion that was treated on an, on an, on an average length had 26 millimeters. So that was diffuse disease. It was not so, so much focal as we have shown us with our two examples. So much more diffuse calcified lesions. And next please, if we go to the intercoronary imaging, we saw that the amount of calcium and the distribution of calcium in the circumferential arc of the vessel was almost covering 300 degrees. So that was more or less a, 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 a three quarter of the arc that was covered by a, a large burden of calcium, which had an average thickness of almost one millimeter. Now, if you then see that you get almost full and complete stent expansion apposition and a very, very good minimum stent era uh, after implantation. That really shows the benefit of the lesion preparation using this kind of technology. Next, please. And this then finally translated into uh, the different definitions of device uh, and angiographic and procedural success, which you can see here. Independent of what kind of success you are looking at, we are significantly uh, higher than 90%. Achieving something like that is without a very good change in the compliance of the uh, calcified lesion with a good technology not possible. Therefore, these kind of technologies uh, like the IVL are very, very helpful in addressing these heavily calcified lesions and coming up with a good, good kind of uh, success. Thank you, Michael. So this is uh, uh, concerning uh, efficacy. How about safety, uh, Benjamin? Yeah, for sure, and I think it's an important future. Next slide, please. Next. So you know that what we see in the CAT study, and especially in the CAT-3, that there is a very high safety profile of IVL, especially uh, during the procedure, and you can see that there is less than 3% of uh, angiographic complication and only 0.3% of perforation, which occur not after IVL, but after stent. So it's a very safe procedure. Next. And when we focus on the primary safety endpoint, which was uh, 30 days MACE, you can see that there is only 7.8% uh, of MACE, which are mainly driven by periprocedural uh, infarction. So, something which is very safe during the procedure and something which is very safe during the follow-up. Next. One thing that I'd like is uh, that the periprocedural myocardial infection have been uh, focused on uh, old definition because it was the definition of orbit 2 mandatory by the FDA. And so it was on CKMB, three, uh, three upper normal limits. But when we make sensitivity analysis with strictly definition of periprocedural MI, and you can see on the sky definition that the periprocedural MI decreased to 2.8% on the procedure. So I think that the leading and the key message of IVL, Michael shows that it's very efficient, but I think one point is, is very safe. It's an important message. And you can see at 30 days, Despite we are dealing with complex lesion, you have only less than 1% of stent thrombosis. Thank you, uh, Benjamin. Uh, um, we have also um, a sub-study performed in 100 patients included in the Disrupt Card 3, providing interesting consideration uh, on the mechanism of action of intravascular lithotripsy. So if we can see uh, in the next uh, slide, the um, issue of the calcium fracture going from a left to the right in this slide, calcium fracture actually was observed in two thirds of the cases after intravascular intercripsy. And these fractures mostly consisted of multiple fractures. 
So the rate of fractures further increased after stent implantation, especially by increasing the fracture width. You see that on the right uh, of, the, of the slide. Of interest, micro CT study support the notion that a certain proportion of fractures of, or micro fractures escape the power of resolution of, and, uh, and the depth of visualization from OCT. And this is undoubtedly confirmed, if we go to the next slide, by similar minimal stent area and stent expansion, respectively on the uh, panel on the left and in the middle, in the presence or in the absence of OCT confirmed fractures. So, um, Michael and Benjamin, we had a nice overview. I think we can take the slide out. We had a nice overview of the data coming from Disrupt Cut 3. We discussed about uh, safety, we discussed about efficacy, we discussed about the mechanism at large. But there are several concerns, several points that are raised by the colleagues in the community. And one uh, concern that is coming back and again, Benjamin, this is for you to address, it's the possible um, arrhythmias induced by intravascular lithotripsy. There is even one colleague questioning about uh, the length of QT before delivering the shocks. Another colleague afraid of ventricular fibrillation. Can you, can you give us some words of uh, reassurance here? Yeah, it's an it's important point that raised by our colleagues next. Uh, when you deliver the therapy, you can see on the ECG some spikes, uh, which is related to uh, the acoustic pressure. This is not electricity from the electricity generator. It's more mechanical uh, cardiac stretch activation. And sometimes these spikes can capture uh, the beat, making the famous shock topics. And uh, this feature has been evaluated in the CAD3 study next. And so the investigator uh, have shown this uh, shock topics in nearly 171 patients, but have never been correlated to sustained ventricular arrhythmia. And I think it's a very important thing uh, to share. Uh, these shock to topics are frequent, but almost benign and never in the study associated to more complex ventricular arrhythmia. Michael, let me um, further extend this discussion on possible uh, issues and concerns or drawback of this current iteration of the device. Do you have any point, any comment to, to add here before taking additional questions from the colleagues? Yeah, I think one point is important to, to understand that the device the catheter, the balloon, is not a really dilatation balloon. It's an application balloon. So you see, we, we just want to open it um, four atmospheres, maximally six atmospheres. So this is not a range we are usually working in, in, in calcified lesions. So that is what we need to understand. It's a, a to some extent, fragile, more fragile scenario here because the rated burst pressure with 10 atmospheres is quite low. And in a, in a very calcified lesion where the surface is quite spiky, that could sometimes create in a rupture of the balloon. Um, that is what we have to know. We always realize that this could also happen with non-compliant balloons, but this is something where we should not overstretch the um, aspect of that balloon. This is not the balloon that should create the post-dilatation. It's just for the application of the pulses. Uh, concerning this issue of balloon rupture, there was also one of the question uh, from the colleague, and this is first to you, Michael, and then to Benjamin. How often does it occur? How often did it occur in your hands, actually? In my hands, uh, three times. Three times in now about 80 cases. And it was related to what, if you can share your experience? I, I, I would like to say it was related to the fact that there was a spike of calcium peeking into the lumen where even the four atmospheres really caught that up and, and the balloon ruptured. Um, we, we had the same story afterwards with a non-compliant balloon at 10 atmospheres, etc. So this is this is something which is not, I, I won't call it a downside of the, of the technology. Um, we have to have a balloon technology where we need to bring it down there and where we had to open 
open it. So with the current version, actually, it is four to six atmospheres, which is our working pressure. This is what we should accept. We should not then try to make it better going to 8, 10, 12 or something like that. Then the likelihood of getting a rupture is significantly higher. Anything to add on this point, Benjamin, from your side? Nearly 100 Ks and uh, only three rupture, two related to a uh, spikel, classic spikel, and one related to a uh, misutilization by one of operators go to 10 atmosphere and not follow the instruction for you. For you. So I'm pretty in line I, with Michael. I think I agree with you. This is a more of a lesion related complication. It can occur with any kind of device rather than a device related complication. There was one of the colleagues that actually posed a very interesting point, uh, Benjamin. Since uh, IVL is associated with multiple fractures, is there any data, as far as you're aware, I find it a very interesting hypothesis, is there any data that would suggest a better uptake of the drug from a drug-coated balloon or from a drug loading stand? Since we interrupted, we discontinued the calcified ring in multiple spots. Any thought about this? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. And um, we know that uh, uh, the calcium is, is a big problem for the diffusion of the drug. And so uh, you need incalcified lesion to prepare your, la your lesion in order to have the, the most eluting of the drugs uh, in the arterial wall. Um, as you perfect shown, there, there is macro fracture are not a sign of efficacy of IVL because Emmanuel, you perfectly shown that there is uh, nearly 60% of the patients that have macro fracture on OCT, but 40 patients are probably micro, micro fracture. And so um, I think there is no actually uh, data to correlate the number of fracture in OCT and the efficacy of the delivering of the drugs. Um, and you cannot use OCT uh, to have some data on that, but my, my key message is on calcific lesion, you have to prepare your lesion for a better elution of the drug. Yeah, uh, actually one of the colleague uh, who's uh, perhaps more into peripheral vascular intervention uh, makes reference to the PAT3 data that were presented last month that showed actually superiority of intravascular lithotripsy over POBA. Thank you very much, by the way, for sharing this insight. Uh, and there is this superiority in procedural outcomes in peripheral uh, and the goal of looking at long-term outcomes in the follow-up one year, which will, uh, uh, this data will become available shortly. Um, so very good. Let me see, because we still have a lot of questions. And by the way, thank you very much for contributing here. Uh, again, imaging comes back and again. Of course, if we would use imaging systematically, we would know whether we modified sufficiently the plug, but we just heard that we can do these cases also without. How about distal embolization? Michael and Benjamin, do we have data uh, showing whether there is more or less distal embolization with intravascular lithotripsy? I think it's always the question, uh, what is your comparator? So if you take um, the rotablator or the orbital arthrectomy device, probably there is more tissue more microparticles that are going to embolize that could create a no reflow or slow flow phenomenon. Here currently, um, my opinion and my, my experience is that we almost get no reflow apart from the fact if that is a really calcified lesion. We know that if we extrude some kind of vasoactive substances from the lesion, which is usually not the case when it is calcified, that could also cause a slow flow or no flow. But this is something you don't experience with this kind of technology. So these kind of little fracturing, fissuring the plaque all superficially and deeply really is not causing any kind of uh, distal no low f or slow flow phenomenon, at least not in my hands. Benjamin, we have, um, you know, the $1 billion question. Any experience on head-to-head -head comparison between rotational atherectomy and intravascular lithotripsy? Can we reconcile these two uh, technology? At the end, we should put patient at the center here. It's not about the technology. It's not about the device. It's really about the best treatment for our patient. What is your opinion of 
this dichotomy, if there is a dichotomy between these two devices, perhaps we can even combine them. I mean, what's your guess? I, I think we don't have to oppose it, uh, to oppose it atherectomy and intravascular autotripsy. I'm pretty convinced that there is indication for both, sometimes indication for both in the same time. Um, to answer the question of the, the opportunity to make uh, um, a study comparing rotational atherectomy and mitotripsy, I know that there is uh, some team which are working on that. Uh, and perhaps we have some indication about that in the, in the next year. But I think uh, it's more a problem of indication. And uh, we don't have to oppose it because there is some perfect indication of atherectomy, especially when nothing crosses uh, the lesion or only the rota wire. And uh, the case of Michael could be uh, a case like that. And, and I think there is perfect indication of IVL, like you see this focal stenosis long in, in the distal artery. So we don't have to oppose these two technology. We have to combine it if it's, it's necessary. Michael, any, any opinion on this? No, I, I think at the current moment, um, if it is very focal, there is, a, for me, a, a kind of preference to go with the IVL. Um, if it's more diffuse, where I need to use more than one catheter, you always have to balance the monetary aspects there. So I, I think um, once the company comes out with a certain kind of longer devices allowing to have more pulses to be administered, that would be then a better challenge niveau for the rotablator. But at the moment, I think it's good to have both of them. Um, I, I think there are good ideas to prefer this one or that one in an individual scenario. And there are also cases where I strongly believe there is a kind of composite aspect that uh, can be used uh, by using both of these technologies. I think that's a, that's a very nice uh, consensus point that we can take home from uh, the discussion on uh, this interesting and novel technology. Uh, we are perfectly on time, and I guess we addressed uh, most, if not all, the, the questions and the points raised by our colleagues. And if you don't have any, anything else to add, uh, Benjamin and Michael, I would move forward to our conclusion, uh, conclusive remarks. So if we can have back our slides. So um, intravascular lithotripsy is a novel intravascular therapy able to ease the treatment of heavily calcified coronary stenosis. The efficacy and safety has been proven so far in observational prospective studies. We have seen uh, and we discussed in this webinar the uh, Disrupt Cut 3, but there are other two observational studies uh, before that have shown the same kind of messages. We just learned from uh, Michael that future iterations of the technology promise to overcome some potential current drawbacks. We heard of a, a longer balloon coming up, perhaps with better crossing profile, with the possibility to uh, also um, deliver more pulses per treatment. That is also a feature that is going to improve, most likely. And perhaps we are going to hear more about this ECG capture and a way to overcome it. Uh, with this, I think uh, I would like to thank my colleagues and uh, companions in this webinar, uh, Benjamin Anton from Clinique Pasteur and Michael Aude from Neuss in Germany. I'd like to thank the PCR crew for the excellent support, audiovisual support. And of course, last but not least, I would like to thank our sponsor to have made this webinar possible. With this, I'd like to invite you to visit PCR online in order to check for the upcoming webinars. There are very interesting webinars out there coming up. Please visit the website. And I wish you uh, a safe uh, time in this very difficult period. Bye-bye.